The offering of the Holy Sacrifice the Mass is obviously the highlight of any priest's day. And it's the most important thing they can do in his life. And it is it's the most beautiful thing to stand at the altar and offer the sacrifice, and worthy as we are. change the bread into the body and the blood, wine into the blood and uh, offer that sacrifice to God. before that my mother prayed for, before she got married, to marry a, a very Catholic husband and she wanted eight sons and she wanted all of them to be priests. The priest told her that she, she may have eight sons uh, but they probably wouldn't all be priests and she, in fact she did have eight sons and a daughter and two of us became priests and two others became religious. I felt I had a vocation when I was 13 so it wasn't um, a bright intellectual light that told me I had a vocation. It was just a f kind of a, um, a feeling that had, was within me that God was possibly calling me to follow him as, as a priest. When I was younger, uh, I asked for signs to know if this was my vocation. And I'd say, well, if there's something happened, then I know I've got a vocation. And every time I asked for a sign, I got the sign that I wanted. So I was convinced that I had a vocation. Uh, I did go to a Catholic school. I was interviewed by the rector of the school, asking if I wanted to be priest and I thought to myself um, I didn't want to be a priest like a Jesuit, I was a Jesuit at school because I didn't like school which is a bit of a, a strange thing but anyway so I didn't like school, I didn't want to be a Jesuit so um, I didn't do anything, I didn't follow the, the calling in any way from then. But it was when I had left school and gone to university, for, uh, left home and um, in a certain sense had a, a, a misfortune in my life and that made me think well maybe God is telling me I should follow my vocation and so at the age of uh, 19 I started praying the rosary every day and decided to follow my vocation to the priesthood. I went to the traditional mass the first time when I was year 19, after being at university for a year, and having, I'd never really studied Latin. I did so at school, but I didn't know Latin, and I went to the Latin mass. But I was so taken by the mass that I said to myself that I will go to this mass for the rest of my life, and it's, which is what actually happened. But anyway, I made the decision to go to Switzerland to study the, in the traditional seminary and learn the traditional mass. Um, I did speak to my parish priest, but I found that what his answers were rather watered down and unconvincing about not going there, whereas the traditional priest convinced me absolutely. It was, it was kind of clear, black and white, I knew what sin was, and so ended up going to Switzerland to study to be a priest. What is a priest? So he's an intercessor, he's, he intercedes for man. He stands at the altar and offers the holy sacrifice of the Mass. In our order we wear the traditional habit with the rosary 
and a crucifix that is uh, within our habit. And we wear this all day, every day. There's not a day that I do not wear the habit. And I think that wearing the habit is a very powerful sign. Uh, it has several effects. It reminds the priest of who he is and what he should or shouldn't be doing. When I was traveling to India once, um, as I was getting on the plane, the pilot of this airline it was actually a Muslim airline, but the pilot was a Catholic and he caught me as I got into the plane and said, are you a Catholic priest? I said, yes, I am. He says, could I go to confession during the flight? So I said, yeah, of course you can, there's no problem at all. And so he said, oh, that's, that's great. So I'll put you into first class and I'll come and visit you during the flight. And so myself and the companion were put into first class and during the flight, the captain came down and made his confession and received absolution. And uh, I've never heard from him again, but that would never happen if I was dressed as a lay person. So I think the great witness that can be of priests. And often when we're visiting hospitals, I was recently visiting my father's hospital, so many people came up and asked for prayers, asked if I could bless someone. So there's a powerful witness in the habit. Well, the desire to become religious came from seeing the Franciscan habit. I saw this monk wearing the brown habit with the white cordon and sandals on his feet. And I thought, that's really amazing. I'd, I'd love to be like him. It was that witness of the habit that made me want to be a, a religious like him. Confession is the gauge of the, the, the conversion and the sanctity of the faithful. It's there that we see the hidden parts of someone's soul. So it's a huge privilege to be able to hear confessions um, and a very important part of our ministry. Uh, obviously it's totally secret. Uh, so the seal of confession is under, you know, we'd rather die than ever reveal what we've heard in confession. But a priest does see uh, grace working in souls through confession. Do we need to be holy in order to become a priest? One might think of the example of St. Augustine who actually had a child out of marriage and he became a priest. But he had that child before he was baptized. The state of religious life is someone who's striving after perfection. He's, he doesn't join the religious life because he's holy, he joins because he wants to become holy. Normally you should have acquired a certain amount of holiness before you become a priest. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be a saint. None of us are worthy. But that holiness can be acquired during the seminary, the studies, and that's when it should be. When I was a, a younger priest, I heard from an older priest um, a bit of a saying that uh, was concerning the priesthood, and he said that young priests think that they are holy, but they're not. A middle-aged priest thinks he's not holy, and he's not. And an older priest thinks he's not holy, and he probably is. And uh, I was saying, well, 25 years is kind of the middle age of priesthood, and I think for myself, I'm probably at the stage of, I don't think I'm holy, and I'm probably not. <laughs> If I am the priest I am today, I owe so much of that to Father Michael Mary, who was there at my ordination and we began our religious order together. But I certainly owe so very much to him who has been my support all the way through my priesthood. The closest friend that I have, a friend in life, is one of the greatest treasures that anyone can have. And so Father's been my greatest friend. and. Uh, great support of my priesthood and it's certainly through his example, prayers, encouragement and devotion that uh, I am where I am today. Looking back over 25 years of priesthood, one may ask, you know, is there anything during that time that was uh, pivotal or really important? I think from the beginning of my priesthood, my desire was that I would be with my mother when 
that she died and be able to lay her to rest. And she had attended her two granddaughters' weddings and was returning home from the UK and fell sick on the flight back and was admitted to hospital by my father. He said, oh, you don't need to come out. But I just knew I was profoundly moved by hearing the news and I knew there was something definitely wrong. And so I flew out immediately, as soon as I could, to South Africa. She was, came out of the hospital on the day I arrived, which was God's providence, and I was able to offer the Mass for the last few days that she was living. And particularly on the last day, the Saturday, um, the 12th of December, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, she'd been a bit disturbed through the night and called for me. Uh, but then anyway, in the morning, I offered, it, offered up the Holy Sacrifice, the Mass, for her intentions. She was alert completely for Holy Communion, had been a bit uh, sleepy before that, and went into a, a kind of a sleeping mode afterwards. But then during Thanksgiving, when we were kneeling around her bedside, uh, we, she started praying the, the Rosary, which we prayed, and then I offered up the prayers of the dying and the uh, Divine Mercy Chaplet. And it was during those prayers that I noticed that her breathing had almost stopped and I said, I think she's mom's died. And my dad was there and my sister, we were together, so the, the four of us, and they, they thought, no, 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 it can't be. And anyway, I said, yes, she, she's passed away. And so it was the greatest consolation of my priesthood to be with her and what an amazing death for a mother who wanted to have a priest's son that her priest's son could be with her and assist her at the last moment, give her all that she needed to enter eternal life with confidence and uh, yeah, receive the grace of God of salvation. This last year has been an amazing journey for me, personally, um, in seeing so many souls draw closer to God. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite tangible to see the grace working here on our chapel, and it's, so it's a huge privilege to be at the head, as it were, of this chaplaincy. And um, I hadn't thought about it until couple of months ago that, and it had been mentioned to me before by Father Michael, but that in a, you are my children. It's, a, it's an ex extraordinary thing that I am a father, a priest, and therefore you are my children, spiritual children, and there's a great obligation that I have towards you. So being aware of that makes the the burdens which are there as well, so much easier to bear. a sign uh, from God, a prayer that I, I made and I asked for a sign to show that the prayer would be answered. I can't tell you what the prayer is, but I can tell you that I received the sign. Um, I received the sign about two years later. It was uh, my sister had videoed the ordination ceremony and I asked the sign that uh, during the ordination ceremony the priest 
puts oil on your hands during the singing of the Veni Creato. And there's a word where the, the, in the verse it says the spiritual unction um, comes down upon. And I said, you know, if that was the moment that uh, I was getting my hands anointed, it would be a sign that it was God's will. And there were obviously there were 11 priests you've probably seen in the photograph. And so the chances of it happening were kind of slim, really. And I completely forgot about it during the ordination, but when I watched the video, I saw this two years late and I thought, wow, <laughs> thank you. I think I've said already that the Holy Sacrifice, the Mass, is the most important part of my day. and. Uh, a very holy Archbishop once said that when you've said the Mass, you've done 90% of the work for the day. <laughs>